So we discussed it all the way along, what we were each we were doing, you know, and, and how it would possibly relate and resonate with uh, the other artist's work. So it was really I'm thinking of doing this. I mean, I guess the starting point is the the fingers that we can talk about in a minute. But I they were kind of it wasn't like it was set in stone, but it was sort of fixed that I would make these, and they were already in process. And then we we kind of worked around somehow we found work that made sense it was very easy and very kind of kind of fun and, and like a um, in a sense it was just like we were bouncing ideas off one another not really in a collaborative way because we were just doing our own work but but kind of trying to make sure that they did have some resonance with us we kind of agreed on everything and we then realized that the space was actually pretty big so we decided to not make things that are big, but play around with scale as well. I thought they would work in this situation because the the flea market seems to have a lot of things that you're not 100% sure of the history of. So you find a lot of material here that probably came from buildings or came from inside of wherever, cinemas or aeroplanes or everything. The history is kind of not 100% clear. So I like this idea of uh, these cut-off fingers where we're not overly sure where they, they started from. I mean, I, I kind of know where they started from and I, I sort of decided to keep that information a little bit quiet, even though it's probably clear to a lot of people. Um, First I was thinking of doing three, just the primary colors to respond to the fingers, and then I decided later, after I'd already come up with that idea, to do five colors, because I thought the apparatus would be more interesting. And, um, yeah, just, yeah, well, five fingers, I guess. And like, it was, um, uh, anyways, I was thinking also a little bit about a piece of, of Gerhard Richter's, of those glass panels, I don't know the piece is called, where they tilted panels, or, and they're playing in this kind of different angles. I chose five colors, three primary colors, and then green and orange, secondary colors. So it can be viewed from both sides. It could be, obviously, it could be installed in a way that they're all just vertical, or uh, that would be up to the person, that, you know, exhibiting it or whatever. So it was meant to be kind of flexible in that, in that way. It's funny because this, all, this whole painting practice of drip painting, pour paintings that I did, kind of came out of a, out of a fiction because it came out of a, of a large uh, photographic work that I did called uh, The Gifted Amateur, mm -hmm. which is a, about a guy who's, a, who's like a, maybe a, a dentist or a doctor or a professional from Vancouver who's just come back from New York after seeing uh, Morris Lewis exhibition. 
and he's kind of inspired to sort of do these paintings himself in his living room. So the first one I did was a, as a prop for, for a uh, for a photograph. And then I made, when I showed the photograph, I made a series of small ones, and I continued making them. Uh, so I've, I've done that s several times with works where I've continued the work of the, of the imaginary artist in, in the piece. <clears throat> in that case, so it was these drip paintings. So this kind of evolved into a sculpture out of a photograph. It's called uh, uh, Hat Toss, Hat Press. Two parts. The Hat Toss is an action that I performed in my studio where I taped out an area six by eight feet and then stood a distance away and threw my hat to determine the placement of the hat um, with the idea that I would make a sculptural piece later, but that I'd make five sculptural pieces. Um, in which the hat was actually pressed, uh, or the or the the the, uh, the brim of the hat was pressed under a piece of heavy one-inch uh, steel, the same size as the, as the area that I taped out on the floor. Um, When you stuff an animal, the idea is that they they look alive. Um, although it's nice to stuff them so they look dead, I mean that's also quite funny. But uh, it's clearly dead. But when you uh, a taxidermy, that's the, it's their job to make the animals seem alive, however and whatever they do. But by adding this kind of this, an owl, because in its nature it can turn its head quite not in a circle, but a long way round. So you have this idea that it's sort of almost real, but it's now kind of telling the time and turning once a minute. So it just becomes this strange clock. I mean, I guess like a cuckoo clock that would come out and, uh, every hour, or maybe even every 15 minutes. But I often like this idea that the people have assumptions. I mean, it's always the case that when you make a certain amount of work in a certain way, that people assume that everything you do then is related to uh, something else. Or they can just accept it for what it is. So it's just a... It's a bass drum. It's just connected via a computer to a clock that, uh, and a small motor that pulls, um, pulls the drum pedal down. So it just chimes the hours, like a, similar to a clock. Uh, and I guess music, it's about this rhythm and keeping time. So it, again, it's time that's connected to a clock rather than to like a, a song. So 60 minutes it's basically silent and then it just comes to life every hour. And so I'm sure plenty of people will come to see the show and think that it's broken. I mean I like this idea as well that it's sort of dormant like a volcano and then every hour you just get this whatever it be on board.
came to me to make a sculpture, a, a sculptural component to the piece based on maybe one of the one of the uh, action shots. And I chose this one here. And I made a coat stand to hold that coat in that in that position. It was fun to kind of take the photograph and try to like yeah freeze it in, and also in three dimensions so you could sort of see uh, see that. And so it kind of came out. I guess the things came out of this idea of the body and in terms of his fingers, I suppose, as Jonathan's original idea, and then clothing, and, you know, and those two, these two pieces are about, were more about, were about clothing. So I was kind of interested to make this kind of irrational looking sculpture structure that actually is a functional uh, uh, coat, coat rack, but it holds a coat in this very absurd kind of action position. The other work, I guess, that I should talk about is the door, yeah. which was kind of when Jonathan and I were talking about the show. He was you, you didn't do it specifically. No, not specifically. That's a piece that already existed. I guess in the same way as drum, the drum piece, and it kind of comes out of the music, kind of our interest in music, uh, mutual interest in music, and and he was talking about Morrissey and, and, and uh, uh, in our er, earlier dialogue, and I guess the inspiration. The, uh, of, of the light box piece with the negative and uh, I knew I had this piece and I, ha I have not exhibited it actually very much and I just thought in terms of there's a connection from Morrissey back to Elvis in terms of stylistic you know uh, uh, you know his fashion you know his look you know and uh, knowing that it has a connection to Elvis gives it another dimension altogether um, it's one of those pieces I think probably depends on knowing that, you know, it's probably not so, not so interesting otherwise. You might not, if you didn't know that it was solid silver too, you might, so it is like a large piece of jewelry, a crazy large piece of jewelry. 